Hi, welcome back to our channel where we dive into the best practices in psychiatric drug tapering. In today's video, we're gonna be addressing a vital topic that many of you have asked about, and that is the top things that you need to know before starting a drug taper. We're gonna cover five of those, which I consider to be the most important. And so whether you're considering tapering off your psychiatric medication, or if you're already in the process of doing so, Understanding these five key points is essential for a safe and effective taper. We're gonna be exploring what you need to consider when you're planning your taper and why each step matters. But remember, tapering medication should always be done under the guidance of a healthcare professional. So acute withdrawal can present in two different ways. There's the classic withdrawal presentation, which I think of when people are cold turkeyed off their medications or they drop down on their dose in too large of a milligram reduction. And then there's also the interdose withdrawal pattern, which almost exclusively happens with the benzodiazepines and drugs like Ambien, and that looks a little bit different. And so we're gonna go into those two different types. What do you need for a classic withdrawal presentation? Well, you need to be on the drug for at least two weeks. Most of the people that develop dependence and tolerance to these medications have been on them for years, but you need at least two weeks for even those changes to be there for you to even have this type of withdrawal. And it typically begins about a week after you come off your medication or you drop your dose, but sometimes it can take a little bit longer, like if you're on Prozac and it has a long half-life, but mostly it kicks in usually around two to three days after. The most important thing you need to remember is you don't need to have a large milligram drop to experience acute withdrawal. And I see this frequently in my practice, you know, that, that people will go down in a very linear way. They'll be on mirtazapine, you know, they'll start at 15 and they'll knock off a milligram every couple of weeks. And then when they go from two to one, they start having really severe symptoms and they go, you know, this can't be withdrawal because I've tolerated a milligram reduction every two weeks. But it is that way because of the hyperbolic nature of uh, drug binding, which means that as you get to the lower doses, even a small milligram reduction can result in a big change in drug receptor occupancy that can cause severe symptoms. And so remember, it doesn't have to be a large milligram drop for you to get this acute withdrawal. And the symptoms, they're typically gonna be the opposite of the drug effect. So with the benzos, these drugs are, you know, reduce anxiety and insomnia. People are gonna be more anxious, have more insomnia, they're gonna have tight muscles, all, all of those types of things. And typically reinstatement, so when you bring the drug back in or you put the drug back up to the previous dose, it's gonna start improving those symptoms within a week. So how do you treat this classic withdrawal presentation? I know there is a lot on this slide. Please don't read it right now or get overwhelmed. I'm gonna just explain the general principles, which are a lot more intuitive and easy to understand. We're thinking about two things when we're treating classic withdrawal. One, we want to reintroduce the drug at the appropriate level. You know, you may not always wanna go back to the previous dose and you wanna do that for two things. One is because if you've been off the drug for a while, you may not need to go back to the previous dose that you were on before you reduced. You might be able to take a half step there and uh, feel a lot better and then you don't lose all of that progress that you've made by being on a lower dose for several weeks. And the second thing, that we want to avoid is something called kindling. And kindling is a term that people use to describe uh, nervous system instability. So a lot of people, after they go through acute withdrawal, they develop severe symptoms and they find that when they go back on the drug at the same dose, it actually goes paradoxical in them. They actually start to feel worse. And that's because their nervous system by going through that withdrawal has become really sensitized and it just starts to respond to the drugs in funky ways. And so we want to prevent people from having that bad kindling reaction when they reintroduce the drug. And so we tend to introduce it at a lower dose. Now I'll bring you, your attention back to the, to the slide. If it's been two weeks since you've been cold turkeyed off or had your drop, it's usually pretty safe to go back to 100% of the last dose because you haven't been in the withdrawal for too long. If it's been between two to four weeks since then, I would advise that you start at 50% of the difference between the dose. So if you went from two milligrams to one milligram, just start it off at 1.5 milligrams, sit there for five days and see how you do. If there's no improvement in five days, you could then go up to 100% of the dose. And the same principle is gonna apply as you go further out. So for instance, if you're off for a month to, to eight weeks, maybe just start at 25% of the dose difference. So that would be at 1.25 milligrams if you went from two to one milligram and had symptoms and then step up to 50%. Uh, stay there for five days and then you could step up to 100%. It's not an exact science, but this should generally guide people in uh, reintroducing the drug in a safe way. What about after eight weeks? So is it possible to have acute withdrawal after eight weeks off the drug? Most people are gonna say no, because typically acute withdrawal resolves within, it's usually really, really bad for two weeks, 
and then most of it is gone by eight weeks. And so if you're having symptoms still eight weeks out, there's a chance that you've, you've gone protracted. Despite this, some people uh, still report uh, getting better after reintroducing the drug after eight weeks. So a lot of people want to simply try this. They want to turn over the rock. They want to make sure that they've taken the chance to feel better and not be in this acute withdrawal. Here's what I would recommend if you're thinking of reinstating after eight weeks, thinking that you might have acute withdrawal. Restart at 10% of the dose difference. So if you went from one milligram to zero, you might restart at 0 0.1. And then it follows the same pattern that you saw on the previous slide where every five days or so you would go up a little increment and then you would just kind of gauge to see how you feel. Most people are gonna notice at least some improvement in five days. If you're noticing it's improving, just stop there and just kind of give it another couple of weeks to see where it goes to. And if it stalls out, maybe you could go a little higher on the dose and then wait to see if it's improving further. Okay, so that's, that's how you would treat classic withdrawal. What about the interdose withdrawal presentation? This is only really relevant if you're taking a benzodiazepine like Xanax or Ativan or Clonopin, or if you're on drugs like Ambien. The only antidepressant I can really think of where this may apply is instant release Effexor or instant release Wellbutrin. And that's why we kind of dose those with um, you know twice a day or three times a day dosing. Here's what it looks like. When, when you have this, you start to have withdrawal symptoms right before your next dose. So within an hour or two before your next dose, like let's say you're taking Valium two times a day, you might have a lot of withdrawal, like mood instability, irritability, tearfulness. And that's a sign that you're going into withdrawal between the two doses. And so how would you treat this? Well, you're gonna maintain the same dose of the medication, but you're gonna to start to space it out more. So if you were on three milligrams of clonopin a day and you were taking 1.5 in the morning, and 1.5 in the evening, I would advise you to split it into one milligram three times a day, spaced eight hours apart. And what you're seeing here on this slide is why we recommend people do this. So in this dark filled line, this is what a serum concentration of the drug looks like on a once a day dosing. You know, get this big peak, it goes up, and then it goes down and kind of peters off. When you increase the frequency of dosing, as is shown in this like dotted line, you're gonna have these smaller peaks, they're gonna go down and then you're gonna have another one. What we're trying to do is to have less peaks and valleys in the serum drug concentration. And that hopefully is gonna give you greater mood stability and, and less of that interdose withdrawal. The first thing I usually recommend people do is they're gonna space out the medication they're already on. If they're still having interdose withdrawal, after that, they may want to try a drug like Valium and to give that a go. Next question, what do I do if I'm still feeling terrible after spacing out the dose? Well, one possibility is that you could be developing an emerging toxicity. And I see this a lot with my protracted withdrawal patients that they'll be on benzodiazepines for a long period of time and then they'll feel terrible for about a year, just really, really bad. And they'll try to kind of space the doses out and it doesn't really work. And then bam, they develop protracted withdrawal. And it's just kind of gradually kind of developing while they're on the drug. And so if this happens, you really need to go and do a slow taper. And the best way of definitively knowing whether it's protracted withdrawal and not some kind of acute withdrawal or interdose withdrawal presentation is by trying to go a little higher on the dose. Because if you go a little higher on the dose and you notice that the symptoms don't improve, then it's not a withdrawal problem. It's, it's become a protracted withdrawal injury. Moving on now, so step two. After we've addressed acute withdrawal, we're gonna start talking about uh, treating side effects. This is the next thing that you need to look at in prioritizing which drug to remove. So you've managed acute withdrawal, now we're gonna decide which drug needs to go. You wanna remove the drugs that are causing side effects. This could be psychiatric and it could be non-psychiatric. For instance, if you're having a lot of muscle pain and memory impairment and you're on a statin, that might be contributing a lot to how you're feeling and you wanna make sure that you know that and you remove that drug. How do you know what the side effects are of your drug? This can be really tricky and this is probably the area that requires the most knowledge. So you need to work with a psychiatrist who sees, sees these things day in, day out. If you wanna do, try it on your own, I would recommend that you go to dailymeds.com. This is the link here and I'll show you how it looks like. So. And so you can go to this website, dailymeds.com, and then you can search for the drugs that you're taking, and then you can open them up, and you can look through the prescriber information here, and you can read all about the different side effects of your drugs. I usually think going to warnings and precautions is the best place to get the most important information about the drug. Um, but I will say that 
out of all of the, the, the planning steps in this, this really requires probably cl clinician involvement because it's hard to recognize these things unless you've seen them several times. And that's where the clinical experience of a doctor comes in. And that could be really helpful. Moving on. So what are some of the serious side effects that I see uh, in my patients that I want to have addressed? Serious side effects could be things like systemic inflammation with lamictal. A lot of people come to me thinking they have mold problems or Lyme disease, not all of them do. Sometimes it's a lamictal problem. Things like akathisia, that crazy internal restlessness people get from the antipsychotics, that's a serious side effect. That would make you want to target that drug for removal first. They can have problems like renal and thyroid damage with lithium. If it's severe and if it's progressing quickly, that would make you want to look at lithium reduction first. And then there's things like liver toxicity with Depakote or sometimes suicidality or mood instability with the antidep antidepressants. And so, yeah, you wanna be thinking about serious side effects you could be having when, when you're picking the first drug to start with. So the next thing that you want to do is you want to remove drugs with unpleasant primary effects. This is different from side effects. For instance, if you were sedated on gabapentin, I wouldn't call that a side effect of gabapentin. That's kind of like the primary effect of the drug. It's a, it's a GABA drug. It makes people sedated. If you're feeling keyed up and like a little like energetic on Wellbutrin or stimulants, that's not a side effect. That's a primary effect. Depending on how you are feeling currently, it may be a good idea to remove drugs that are kind of making that state worse. Psychiatric meds, they tend to do three things. They can be stimulating, they can be blunting, and they can be sedating. And depending on your worst symptoms, you can choose to remove the drugs which may be contributing. For instance, if you are having a lot of brain fog and concentration difficulties and you're on a high dose of gabapentin, you should consider removing that one first. If you are on Wellbutrin and you're having a lot of anxiety and insomnia, it might be a good idea to target that stimulating medication first. And if you're having brain fog, but also blunting and you're on an antipsychotic and you find that really unpleasant, you may want to remove that antipsychotic first. These are just some tips that will help you taper in a way that could potentially make you feel better as you're going down on the drug. You know, tapering doesn't always need to be painful and difficult. Sometimes removing these drugs actually makes you feel better. Let's go to step four. Maybe steps one, two, and three aren't really relevant for you and you don't know which drug to start first and you're on several. Well, you may want to remove drugs that are hard to taper, especially if they've been started uh, recently. You know, something I see very commonly is that I'll have patients who take benzodiazepines and then they'll They've been on them for like five years. They go and see their doctor. They, they become unstable because the doctor tapers them too quickly. And then they come to my practice. And the doctor has actually started a lot of medications recently to treat that uh, withdrawal instability. So they've been on like Clonopin for five years and they've been on like Cymbalta for two months and Lamictal for like two months as well. What I would do in that patient after we've stabilized their acute withdrawal is I wouldn't start with the Clonopin. You know, I would start with the Cymbalta and the Lamictal. And the reason I would do this is Cymbalta is one of the hardest drugs to taper. You have to do bead counting. It's, it's really involved and difficult. There's no advantage to tapering the Clonopin first because they've been on that for five years already. Their, their brain is used to it. But if I can pull that Cymbalta out in a couple of months because they haven't been on it long, that'll give them a huge service later on. Because if we started with the Clonopin and picked the Cymbalta up a year later, two years later, now, now their brain's really used to that and they have to do this really slow taper. So just keep in mind that if you've only been on, say, like an antidepressant or a benzodiazepine for a couple months, you may want to prioritize the removal of those because your brain hasn't really adapted to them to them too much. And finally, you wanna look at drugs with severe potential side effects. And so this means like you're not even having these side effects yet, but you want to avoid them. And so I think about three different drugs here. I think about antipsychotics. So they can cause tardive dyskinesia. It's a permanent movement disorder for some people. You may want to prioritize removing that medication first after you've done steps one through four. Next up is lithium. Lithium can cause renal damage and thyroid damage. That's pretty common. You know, tardive dyskinesia and these lithium toxicities are fairly common side effects. So you wanna keep that in mind and, and maybe prioritize them higher. And finally, we've got the serotonergic antidepressants that can cause PSSD. I wanna say that this, at least from my clinical experience, is less common than the first two. And so it's likely uncommon that this is gonna to happen to you, but it's, it's important enough that I want people to think about it when they're planning their taper. And so that's it. I hope this video makes your tapering journey a little more manageable. If you found this helpful, don't forget to like, share, subscribe for more. And if you're looking for someone to help you with your tapering, we're working in several US states that are listed on my website in the link below this video. Thank you so much for watching and take care.